Austria has ended it, says. Well, it was fast, but very, very <laughs> interesting. Great. <laughs> 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 yeah. Hooray. And this is a nice way to start streaming. All of us laughing our hearts out. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, whichever part of the world you are in. Welcome to this panel discussion at the Horasis Global Meeting 2022. The topic for this panel discussion is rebalancing today's labor needs with tomorrow's demographics. Um, I am very, very lucky as the chair of this panel. My name is Professor Aditya Singh. I am based of Mumbai in India. And we have an all-star rock star panel over here, pretty much covering every single time zone on the planet. So, you know, uh, and, and that's what's going to be very, very interesting. We have North America, we have Europe, we have Africa, which is obviously very, very wonderful. And we have Asia covered over here. Uh, the world has changed so much in the past two and a half years. It, it, it's crazy, right? I mean, I mean, none of us could have predicted this, uh, how the world is going to change. And I don't mean only from the COVID perspective, which has actually been a huge change. Look at what we are doing today with these virtual meetings. But if you look at it from a geopolitical perspective, a geoeconomic perspective, and even from a climate change perspective, the changes which we thought would take you know, place over decades and over centuries are now happening in the space of years. Perhaps the biggest, biggest implication of this is what happens to our labor needs, which are based on today's perspectives, basis tomorrow's demographics. Because obviously, uh, if you see the global north, their, pop, their percentage share of global labor is going down because of population controls and so forth. And you have the global south, whose share of, of demography and hence future labor is going up. Along with that, we had just thought in the past 30 years that we're going to become a truly globalized society where you can travel from one place to another to work. And we've seen, unfortunately, because of new geopolitics, Russia, Ukraine being a player, you know, uh, uh, an example, the lockdown in China when it comes down to travel, clearly, that borders are back up. And what does that mean for movement of global labor from one geography to another? And does that also affect other perspectives including ideas and exchange of ideas and trade and business and knowledge. These are some of the things that we, we hope to uh, explore in this panel. A short introduction. My name is Aditya. I'm the founder and director of a business school in India called the Athena School of Management. I'm also a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts, the Royal Asian Society and the Royal Anthropological Institute all in London and UK. I teach, among other subjects, uh, impact leadership and differential thinking. I sit on the advisory network for the ESG Research Center at the University of Chicago. I'm also the chair for the GBSN community for ESG and sustainable finance. And of course, uh, you know, as a professor, I, I try to teach all across the world. I'm also lucky, you know, because professors are supposed to have a lot of knowledge or they're perceived to have it. I do sit on advisory board for several tech, you know, tech companies, startups across the world also. But currently, my avatar is to be the agent provocator over here to put in questions to our amazing panel over here and to see the perspective. So I'd like to ask our panelists to start this entire journey by introducing themselves and then giving a small opening statement about it. And why don't we start, you know, I'm going to go the way my screen shows. So Jacob, you are up first. Thank you, Aditya. And again, good morning, everyone, at least in my time zone. Uh, my name is Jacob, and I'm working within people management for a scale-up company uh, that is within tech and gaming. Uh, so I think it's fair to say that I'm somewhat representing the new economy. Uh, in this panel as well. Uh, I'm also part of uh, the Global Shepherds Community, which is an initiative by the World Economic Forum, and also an advisor and future thinker for uh, a Swedish think tank called Global Challenges, that's mainly working with corporates in Nordics and uh, also governments as well. So, I mean, as you mentioned as well, uh, we are looking in a world that looks vastly different than two years back, and I feel that in order to look ahead and into the future, I think it's fair to, to look in the learnings that we have and the changes that we see. And for me, there are two words that, that comes to mind right away. The first one being collaborations. Prior to, to the whole pandemic situation and the, the war that we see in Europe at least now, is that obviously we've done great things in terms of collaboration. We've been working between companies and governments and institutions. The world of academia, obviously, as well, working closely together with corporates to basically find the needs and also stimulate the markets. But what I see in the, in the past years is that, at least from, from representing a very bureaucratic country, we're starting to loosen up a little bit and seeing potential 
And I'm curious to discuss that as well to see how the changes are looking in different parts of the world. But I'm seeing here at least that we are learning on how to collaborate in a more, maybe a modern way, we can say. The second thing being, which I find it highly interesting, especially in relation to uh, migration now, all types of migrations, is that remote work is becoming more mainstream. And that's something that I find fascinating. Before it was something maybe that we can say hip tech startups were doing before. Uh, they were sort of like the pioneers. But now I, I see a shift here where even governments and institutions are adapting to these changes. And I think that's also going to maybe change the, the world global uh, labor market a, a bit as well. Uh, so these are sort of like the two angles that I'm going into this conversation with. And um, I'm obviously uh, open to discuss different examples and I have some in mind as well. So I'm really, really looking forward to this conversation. So thank you so much. Uh, and I can't wait to spend the rest of the 40 minutes here together. Thanks, Jacob. Torsten, you're up next. Okay, good, good morning from my side in Berlin, actually. Mm -hmm. So uh, I feel relaxed and uh, slept a lot. So uh, mm -hmm. other than others here in the round. Um, I'm a professor too. Uh, I uh, work in uh, Innsbruck in Austria and Berlin. Uh, and uh, I'm a senior fellow at Oxford University. I'm uh, actually pretty much uh, here because I run a, an institute that covers the transformational needs of companies and NGOs because, um, uh, as you might know, that has been quite an issue when it came to to digitization in the first place. Now we deal a lot with companies who want to kind of connect with NGOs in order to tackle some of the environmental questions. But uh, over the last month, the, the question of how to transform the workforce or how to make sure that there's enough workforce in the future it has come up pretty tough, I, I would say. Given the, the, the German situation, I mean, as you're all well aware, Germany is pretty much still an industrialized country. So the idea of mm -hmm. kind of replacing workers in, let's say, parts of Germany, southern parts or western parts or eastern parts with people from abroad via um, video conferences or kind of remote work is, is not that convincing. There's still a huge need for people to actually, if I may say so, uh, by and large work with their hands. And that frightens a lot of companies because they see they, they are somehow, of course, with the demographic change. But on the other hand, also, given the um, the uh, transformation towards a zero or decarbonized economy. So you have two kind of oftentimes you have two companies at the same time, a, a new company that's pretty much uh, kind of going for the decarbonized modern, if you would say so, way of producing uh, and products and producing them. And on the other hand, you still have the old part, you know, like uh, you can see this at the companies who work for, who build cars, right? You have the old combustion engines, but that you still need for the upcoming 10 to 15 years. And you have a totally new company that deals with uh, electromobility, autonomous driving and stuff like that. So you need two different kinds of people. And um, in Germany, the, uh, the discussion or I would say in, in, in this Western part of Europe, the discussion pretty much goes uh, very much along the lines of how can we make people work longer, don't mm -hmm. kind of uh, force them into retirement at an age of 63 or 65, how can we make sure that they're able to do the work longer times? And on the other hand, there's a huge discussion, of course, with, uh, on the background of the Ukrainian crisis, um, which I find interesting is less how do we actually integrate the people and much more on how can we actually kind of train migrants in a way that they then can use the training also when they go back into their homelands. And uh, this way kind of, if, if I may say so, a dual use kind of training in a way that those who want to go back can go back but go back with a lot of lot more skills actually that they then can use in their home countries mm -hmm. as well as in Germany, which I find quite a smart idea if if I might say so. Thanks, Torsten. Uh, and now we go across the pond, as the British say, uh, to Alyssa. So, Alyssa, all yours. Okay. So, I'm a freelance photographer and artist in New York. Um, just to give a little background on me, um, I actually just got back from being on the road. And I think that perspective is where I'll be coming from because through the pandemic, one of the ways that, you know, my industry completely evaporated overnight. There was no more photography. There was no more need for event coverage, you know, headshots. It was it was too unsafe to work and and 
there weren't things happening in person. So mm -hmm. it became a pivot point as an artist of how do I still create work while I'm, you know, in this limbo land of not being able to be employed. Mm -hmm. And that led to working on a lot of projects across the country. Um, and I just got back from working on actually documenting the abortion battle that's happening here in the United States mm -hmm. right now. Um, and what made me able to do all that and still be able to pay rent at the end of the day was the unemployment that was made available to artists, which normally when you're self-employed in the U.S., you have to be paying into unemployment to get unemployment. And because of that, that shift in the way the pandemic was affecting society, a lot more people that weren't eligible suddenly were able to. And that to me was a clear indicator that the universal basic income concept would be a really valuable thing to start implementing because mm -hmm. it made it that even though I didn't have my day job per se still coming in, I had the means to still work on the projects I needed to make that were valuable contributions to society. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that, that, that may be some of the ways to offset these layoffs and unemployment, because if people have financial resources to still pursue and innovate with whatever ways they can in any sort of circumstance, then they're still going to be able to contribute. Even if they get laid off in this sector or that sector, they can pivot. And, you know, instead of it being, they're still on that business track, they now are in a place to become an entrepreneur, innovate because you need capital to do those kind of things. And by being, by being more financially supportive of our, you know, communities across the globe, I think that's going to lend itself to resolving the, some of those issues by letting people have that innovation space and, you know, mental clarity of not stressing about how am I paying rent <laughs> to be mm -hmm. able to, to focus on building new things to combat the issues coming up. So that's where, that's my perspective for the start. <laughs> Thanks, Alyssa. Jarvis, you're next, my friend, from, from London, UK. Now, I don't know if it's sunny or it's overcast, because, well, it's London, isn't it? So, yeah. Yeah, it's just a bit <laughs> raining with some trees, though, but it's fine. You know, I'm used to, to the weather here in London. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Jarvis Chim. I'm a company director of Cinda Corporation. Uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, I'm just running the UK branch on behalf of, of our family business. You know, we need you, uh, you know, uh, um, trust services and company and company formation services um so we tailor to the needs of you know um you know high net worth individuals and and a company um so during uh, my uh, you know personal and work experience um just throughout the pandemic um so um before the pandemic struck you know more than 90 percent uh, of our business revenue uh you know uh was generated offline meaning you know uh you know we we use our offices um across the world including here in london and and other offices um in hong kong singapore and shanghai uh um, to 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 generate business revenue so so throughout the pandemic because most of people uh you know um just got trapped in their homes you know they, they were um they were unable to come out and and and, let, and they caused a lot of issues you know for us to um to to sustain um our business moving forward um so as a result of that so we have shifted um, you know gradually um you know more than 80% of our business services um, offline from offline to online meaning you know all of our clients you know worldwide can um can 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 make an order of our services um through through our websites so we we run two websites one in chinese and one in english um so so we also in, integrated you know some of um some of the high tech Technologies, you know, throughout our websites, you know, including the integration of, you know, AI and due diligence software, you know, uh, 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 you know, from from companies, you know, um, um, so as a result of that, you know, we can, you know, we can, um, you know, we can, we, um, so so once an order has been made, so we can just run due diligence, you know, uh, automatically, um, uh, just you know, using our, you know, AI systems, you know, integrated. Um, um, into our websites, you know. Um, so, 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 so from the other side, I would say, you know, that also means, you know, some of the jobs, you know, might have been uh replaced by 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 such technologies, you know, across the board, you know. Um, so I also understand um throughout the pandemic, 
the youth unemployment rate, especially in Europe, you know, was extremely high. Um, so, um, so I remember uh, at the peak of the at the peak of the pandemic, the youth um, unemployment rate here in the United Kingdom was. Uh, as, as was at a staggering rate of twelve percent, you know, I think that has gone down to to less than five percent. Um, so so that was a big um decrease, you know, um just you know uh, in the youth unemployment rate. But still, you know, as you know, as we moving forward out of a pandemic uh, and 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 the current climate uh, of of the, of the Beijing's trading environment has changed significantly. We need to find a way, uh, you know, um to 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 adapt um, to the new uh, you know eco and social and economic system you know across the across the world, um, so um, uh, yeah, so so yeah, so um, so these were my you know um, takeaways you know uh, of uh, of of the post pandemic you know uh, business environment uh, from my perspective. <laughs> Thanks, Jarvis, and now we go to Paul from hopefully sunny Nairobi. <laughs> yes, uh, indeed. Sunny, good morning from uh, Nairobi. Um, and great to be here. It's my first time at Heresis. Um So I- I'm Paul. I've been building a variety of different social businesses across emerging markets for the last uh, 17 or 18 years. Um, much of my career I've spent in microfinance and financial inclusion as both an operator and a venture capitalist. But uh, more recently have become obsessed with uh, some of the talent and human capital challenges in emerging markets and founded a company called uh, Shortlist, which I, which I lead today. Um, Shortlist started as more of a talent technology, bringing uh, different automation and, and AI to uh, make it easier to hire people. And we've now evolved into, on one hand, an executive search firm, um, working with startups and social enterprises across um, uh, across Africa and India. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we we use our technology to power large scale youth employment programs across uh, uh, particularly Africa, with a focus on uh, getting more young people into careers in clean energy and uh, in digital jobs. So what Torsten mentioned, seeing if we can get people sitting where they are, but doing work uh, on a global scale in the in the global digital economy. Um, we work primarily in sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, it's no secret, um, Africa is an incredibly young population. Uh, the average age in Nigeria is 18. Uh, in UK, it's 40. I think the US is, is, is similar. Um, so there's about to be a, a booming workforce, and there will be more people added to the workforce in sub-Saharan Africa in the next 10 years than the rest of the world combined. And I can share all sorts of other crazy statistics talking about the, the rise of youth. Um, this, this could be a, a crisis. Um, this could also be a massive opportunity. I think the, the cause for concern, of course, is we're already seeing massive unemployment uh, across the region. Official figures tend to downplay it, but um, in many pockets, it's, it's more than 50%. Um, I don't have to explain uh, the, the complexities this can cause at a local household level around healthy living and, 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 and how to uh, support families, um, but it's certainly a, a real challenge. On the positive side, and what we're excited about is seeing ways we can connect this talent pool to global opportunities um, um, in ways that uh, really take advantage of what is a just massive um, um, asset of, of young talent. Uh, and, and I think what we're leaning into is this new world where um, um, creating economic value, doing a job has been decoupled from where you actually sit. Uh, and I'm very sensitive to what Torsten mentioned of, of there's a lot of jobs that uh, um, I mean, you, you can't you have to be there. You have to work with your hands. You have to work with directly people. But we're definitely seeing a shift where more and more jobs, even jobs where traditionally you had to be co-located, you don't need to be uh, um, sitting in the same place anymore. And so we're really um, leaning into that. So when we when we run programs, um, um, what we focus on a few different things. One, um, one of the biggest gaps we see to the employability of young people is just on the job work experience. And so a lot of what we're focused on is in some ways subsidizing people's transition into getting internships, apprenticeships, fellowships, any kind of work experience that can supplement a university degree, because we're seeing that university degrees alone um, don't cut it. Um, no offense, Professor Aditya, um, but uh, um, um, it's, it's an important first foundation, but um, 
as a recruitment firm, we see over and over again that if you show up only with a degree, um, employers are not likely to take a chance on you. And so we're really focused on ways to get people working and then and then using that as an on-ramp to more uh, employment. Uh, we're also obsessed with this last mile of employment. We see such an over, over-focus and over-funding of um, education on the supply side and an underinvestment in understanding what do employers actually want and how do we solve that last mile. So a lot of the programs we do are just reducing the friction by applying our tech and recruitment expertise to just helping companies get people into the open jobs. Because on the flip side, you hear about all the, the unemployed. There's also companies constantly complaining they can't find the people. Um, and so uh, uh, we try to reduce that uh, friction. And then, and then last but not least, um, hoping to, to play a role innovating around how to get the youth uh, in Africa ready for these remote opportunities in the global digital economy. Um, there's a lot of practical infrastructure issues we're looking at and, and are launching right now, a number of um, um, uh, laptop and workspace financing programs um, to get people access to that critical foundation. Their, skill, their skills, both the hard skills, but also the soft skills of cultural understanding, communication. And then there's just a global readiness for this. And, and uh, I think we're seeing that change quickly but there are certainly still a lot of uh, hearts and minds to change around the world about how this might work. And I think it's going to right now, there's still people have options. I think eventually uh, um, this will become an imperative for companies to figure out how to manage this as, as certain um, as certain, including North America uh, populations, uh, population growth slows, workforce is, is in some cases shrinking. Um, and so I think this becomes more of an imperative. So yeah, I'll stop there. But uh, um, this is certainly uh, a topic close to our hearts. Thanks, Paul. I mean, I mean, a great perspective and great work that you're doing in Africa right now. Wonderful to see that. Um, mm-hmm. You know, of course, I also have another avatar where I also happen to be the co-founder of a, of a VC firm, a venture capital firm in Chicago, mm-hmm. which focuses Prometheus, which focuses actually on ed tech. And what we see also is the movement in ed tech from just basic qualifications to actual skill development and last mile delivery. So I think that's something which is happening all across the world. And it's, it's important. I mean, to give you context, at the height of the pandemic, and that's a different perspective from now, definitely, I qualify that statement, 25% of the Indian population was unemployed. Now, mm-hmm. when you take a, a, a base of about 1.2 billion people, that's mm-hmm. the adult population. Right? Well, above 18, that's a lot of people, right? I mean, mm-hmm. uh, uh, yeah. Uh, and, and there's only so much from, from a society and economic perspective that you can subsidize or cross-subsidize people who are not working. Uh, you know, especially in, in economies which are in the global south, they're still developing, which don't have, po- you know, positive cash inflows coming in. Um, mm-hmm. And the problem is it, it's, it's not only restricted to the to the company or the individual. It's also to the entire national policy. I'll give a small example of what's happening very close in our neighborhood in a small island called Sri Lanka, just 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 off our coast, which basically the, the economy has just imploded. And it was foreseen it's going to happen at least two years ago. It's not something that is new. Mm-hmm. It's for mismanagement from a governmental perspective. These are huge challenges which we have to face. But I'd like mm-hmm. to now go back to perhaps to, to Torsten and, you know, asking that, and since you work so much with the, with the sector, is we're seeing, you know, uh, new tech, new industries coming up, right? And, and what does that imply? Does that imply you're going to see only layoffs where you're going to, people are going to lose job because of you know, the technological innovation? Or we're going to see redeployment, you know, of this, the still manpower into another sector, perhaps. And do you see some kind of you know, economic migration also happening from a geographical or a sectoral perspective? And I would say yes, that's the short answer. <laughs> the, the longer answer is, um, uh, I think that's a very German perspective, but I think Germany is in a specific role here with 40% of the GDP still stemming from industrial production and stuff like that. Um, yes, there is a, a huge kind of demand for up and reskilling, and I think there's there's an entire industry just now kind of emerging around this: how to uh, kind of upskill people, how to avoid layoffs, how to kind of use the people for for different jobs. And I think that's in itself that's quite tough because um, if you have people who have been working, let's say, in the, on a production side for 35 years, it's not that easy to kind of turn them into people who sit on their asses and and whatever do kind of controlling or something like that, right? So it is the first challenge is already to find the right, um, to match the skills needed with the people who are there, right? But it's it's doable. I think there's a lot of great, great examples, companies who 
uh, for example, uh, kind of have 20,000 or 30,000 people going through this up and reskilling kind of endeavor to, to make them fit for the next uh, round. And there's all kinds of problems, but I think that's solvable. Uh, so I think, <clears throat> but as I said, the, the specifics about Germany is this will still be a very kind of industrially focused economy. And having said that, the problem to me is doesn't, I think we, we see two kind of groups of, of, uh, of labor in a way. There's one that is open to almost everyone, like the kind of remote work that could be people from Africa, could be people from South America, Asia or something. It doesn't matter, right? That's a global in a way, global market and companies, as you uh, rightfully pointed out, need to, to find their ways in order to compete against each, each other when it comes to these kind of, of, uh, of people. On the other hand, we have this, um, I wouldn't say low skilled work. It's a different kind of work. If you work on an industrial side, you probably need some colleagues to help you in the day to day work. So that is, it can't be done remotely. And, and there's a lot of qualification needed. It's not that the ones are digitalized and, and or digital skills and, and you are bright and the others are just working with their hands, working with their hands in a broader sense means you need to be very qualified. You need to be educated, you need to be able to understand the complex technical processes. That's in essence, at least when it comes to the German economy, that's the biggest problem. We, we, when we've seen the last wave of the migrants coming to Europe, uh, the uh, German, the small and mid-sized companies were pretty happy because they said, you know, we, we need about 200,000 uh, applicants every year in order to fill the, um, the to fill our kind of reservoir of people. But it took, normally it takes about two years of apprenticeship in order to get uh, kind of trained. But with these people, and, and there's no offense intended, but these people oftentimes they need much longer, right? Three to four years in order to kind of uh, provide them with the normal, regular German skills, which doesn't, doesn't mean they have, they have no skills, but they need to have, be on par with, with, their, with their German or French or UK colleagues or something when it comes to schooling, stuff like that. So that's extremely kind of um, expensive in a way. And there's a total different market. Companies are not really kind of skilled, especially these small companies. Then they need a lot of new skills in order to get people from a different culture into the company. It needs also needs to make them more open for changes, right? I mean, just figure out, as an example, if you have uh, at once two or three Muslim kind of employees, you need to think differently about their time for prayer and stuff like that. And and the the kind of famous uh, meals or something like that. So you need to change yourself. It's not only that the employees need to change, you change your own way of doing business and approaching people. That is pretty demanding, but it's doable too. But it's a different kind of market that, that they are uh, Working in right now, Germany faces about five hundred thousand um, or wants to needs five hundred thousand more workers and, and um, skilled labor when it comes to industrial production than than there is. So that means five hundred a year for the upcoming twenty years. That's quite a lot of people that you that you would need to kind of integrate, train, and uh, and make fit for, for, for the labor. And as I said, some of them actually will want to go home, which is understandable. Not all of them are in Germany on their free will. A lot of them would like to go back to their hometown. So, so you need also to find a way to make them skilled in a way that they can use later on, not just, you know, from a German perspective. And that's quite a struggle right now. And that's a very interesting perspective, especially coming from India, where we have, where we have a lot of people available. I mean, 500,000 is, is, is a drop in the ocean for us. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, take more. I mean, that's what you would say. I mean, we can help <laughs> yeah. you. I mean, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, mean, I, mean, I know. But, but and, and that, that's the problem, isn't it? I mean, this, there, there, is, there is geographical, uh, you know, scarcity. But if we see from, from, from a global perspective, the balance is there. The problem is we put up these yeah. barriers, artificial or natural. And, 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 and if we can actually create a situation where we can have that true fungibility and true mobility, we can actually have a lot of things done. But I want to go to Alyssa because Alyssa, as you said, really, you're someone who, who's born the brunt of technological change, uh, the COVID change, right, with which you've seen happening. So what are you seeing happening? And, you know, with, with all respect, the U.S. Is, is undergoing this fundamental change from a political 
sociological and to very honest an economic perspective so are we looking at rescaling upscaling movement into other sectors or is it all hunky dory where everyone says all right we'll see how it goes it's <laughs> i wouldn't say it's all hunky dory that's for sure <laughs> um i think i think one of the big things that's happening is is a big shift in in the gig economy vibes because whether it's Uber and Lyft competing with the taxi drivers in New York or Uber Eats and and like the it's it's all these little gig economies and I even see that creeping in in photography that this seems to be the new 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 fad of business model of outsource and then dilute the industry. And so everybody's working and working more but making less money. And that's a big part of what I think is happening in the US on a large scale and why the the division of wealth is is widening over time here um in terms of new york itself and and how it's functioned in in this pandemic and shift i think the entire city is in a big big transition right now because so many there was a mass exodus of people leaving the city when the pandemic happened and people have come back but it's not the same people like some of it's the same people but by and large a lot of people left and moved out to the to Pennsylvania, New Jersey, upstate New York or or even further and haven't returned while there's this influx of new people coming in. And what I've been noticing lately is while we're all still in this recovery because there's this influx of new new blood in the city, rent prices are rising beyond where they even were before pandemic when when we're still in this recovery phase. And so that's a very interesting thing to see as well because we're we're going to reach a threshold soon of you know it can only go so far. Um so that's that's one of the things I've been seeing a lot in this in the states and there's there's one mentality that I think would be valuable to share specifically for the US but I think every country would benefit from it of we've so long operated from a scarcity mentality because that really was how society functioned for such a long period of time but with all the the technology advancements and the ways we've progressed and globalized we really are in a place where there is more than enough food there is more than enough like we are no longer needing to operate from a place of scarcity and can switch to an abundance mentality it's just i think human instincts kind of get in the way of that of you know survivalism from back in our caveman days but if we can start embracing that abundance mentality and be more open and that would result in more open borders getting more migration of communities and being more fluid with letting people work in other spaces um i think that would be a big shift and we just have to work on changing that global perspective cuz yes yeah, specific to us but i think every country would benefit from that mentality that's interesting so uh jacob you you you're, you're a global shaper you also in the talent acquisition space and you in the nordics where well, a lot of stuff is is very pretty abundant but people is not one of those is it all right so i mean i mean this uh, and of course we see in the nordics lead the challenge so many different new sectors etc so what are the challenges that 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 and opportunities that you foresee in the next 5 to 10 years coming out of that this definitely and probably also push up yeah absolutely thank you and i mean it's definitely a mix uh, and i actually enjoyed listening to uh, uh, professor um toshten as well here because i i think it's fair to say we're also we have this old industrial economy that has been sort of like the foundation for sweden's economy and i would say that i'm slowly seeing a shift here the old more traditional companies uh they have an old workforce very often uh, that have a certain skill set and now we're moving into a more modern economy where we see green energy for example being a huge industry that is booming in Sweden since it's a fairly cold country very popular here to set up new warehouses storages and also uh, server halls for example some of the world's biggest companies are now uh, establishing huge 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 facilities that are opening up for new labor and new opportunities uh, for people globally i would say uh, and they are often located in the most rural areas in sweden so they are also becoming the backbone of the whole local economy for these areas and it's mainly in the most northern part that it, that could usually be seen sort of like abandoned uh, prior to that 
So we're seeing the traditional uh, companies, they are actually doing huge layoffs. Uh, I myself come from one of those small villages that was basically relying on two uh, companies. One was Ericsson, who provided a fiber cable for globally. That was made in, in my hometown. But as soon as they had a layoff, I think it was a, around 8,000 people. That was almost half of the village. Uh, that was had a huge impact. But there we have a great example as well that also showed uh, the opportunity. They saw obviously great capacity among these people and they started programs for upskilling. And soon enough, there was one big company that saw this opportunity and bought basically the whole facility. So this is something that is coming way more popular now that big, large uh, corporates uh, from uh, the States in particular are relocating some of the business to the northern part of Sweden, where the climate obviously has a huge impact, but they also see hardworking people there uh, that are willing to work for the local communities, but also serve greater purposes. Uh, one industry and sector that, that is finding uh, the whole circumstances very challenging is the public sector in Sweden. Uh, and I would also love to connect that to the service industry that obviously has suffered enormously during the past two years. And one example where we have say, seen great opportunities is um, that the nurses and the med medicine industry have struggled in the past two years. And, and I would say they struggled way before that as well. They were underfunded, they lacked training, and they, they basically lacked good HR policies as well, to be quite honest. Uh, during this past two years, they have seen a huge injection, uh, both in terms of staff, but also in, in benefits and such. For example, we saw that we started stretching our standard methodologies uh, when it came to training for, for nurses and caretakers in particular. Uh, so one example of that is, for example, when there was a huge layoff within the whole um, aviation industry, the government together with companies and academia went all together, created a task force so they could hold basically crash courses and intensive courses for people within aviation who are exceptional when it comes to um, service and, and basically caring for the customers. They then just implemented that into the nursing uh, industry. And suddenly enough, we had an injection of more than a couple of thousand of nurses, which were very much needed in these times. And that's one way where I see the collaborations between governments and, um, and corporates is going to be really important and obviously as well in this case as well, together with the world of academia. So I would say the more traditional ways of working are slowly uh, being shaken up uh, with new methodologies and new ways of, of approaching both uh, studies, but also uh, I will also say that we are seeing change in terms of sectors. So green economy um, and I think it's, oh, we can also say AI. I think it's sort of like a buzzword nowadays, uh, but AI technology is huge here as well. And that's thanks to all the research that is being uh, held here at the big tech universities. Uh, and we see a need for global workforces. We're an aging population. Uh, so we are, we are very much welcoming people here. And, and I would say also, uh, our English language skills uh, as Swedes are also improving and that's helping. Uh, the global market as well. I think that's been one of the huge factors here. And, and I believe, my belief at least, without having any statistics, that that uh, a generational shift is, is upon that as well. Thank Thanks, Jacob. You know, uh, when you talk about language skills, I, I never see a, a bigger language school difference when you go to Paris and France, where everyone will speak to you in French no matter what. And then you go just up, and then you go up not to, to, to the Netherlands, to Amsterdam, and everyone speaks fantastic English. And it's ditto in Berlin to a lot of extent also. And I think that's very important. You have to integrate yourself globally to move forward. And on that perspective, I really want to you know, take this question now again back, you know, is Paul, I mean, what we hear in, in Europe and in the US is that there's a labor shortage. You're seeing India, you're seeing Southeast Asia, you're seeing Latin, and of course, you're seeing Africa, where, where, where there's an explosion of talent, uh, you know, uh, raw or, or processed, as I may say it. Uh, which of the sectors do you see them, you know, moving into? And how do you actually make sure that you put a global balance uh, between where there's a deficit and in this case, where there's a surplus? 
Yeah, it's a great question. I think that uh, we've been looking at it less from a sector point of view and more of a functional point of view. And so what um, what what we've been excited to see happening is more of a rigorous review of, of all the jobs that exist in the global digital economy and starting to assess uh, which are the ones that are well suited to uh, um, uh, being done remotely. Looking, looking at factors, um, how easy can this skill be learned? How, how, how manual is it? How important are, is cultural uh, um, um, context? And kind of going down that list. Um, and what we're starting to see are more and more um, companies and programs whose um, um, purpose is to bridge the two. And to be very clear, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to bridge the two. Um, there's a skilling problem and a connection problem. Um, on the a skilling issue, a lot of these jobs are ones that do require more um, um, uh, education, but also uh, practice uh, and, and, and on the job experience. And on the, and on the bridging, um, um, it's great uh, if, a, if an American or Swedish or, or, or British company wakes up one day and says, hey, yeah, we want to we employ these people, but where do you turn? Who are the connectors? Um, um, it's pretty, pretty wild if you just come to, say, Kenya and post a job on a local job board and try to figure out how to make that happen. Um, I think some of the areas that, that we're excited, obviously, there's been a, a lot of talk, uh, at least in our world, there's been a lot of focus on software engineering. That's well and good. That's fine. But I also think that in some ways, by starting with software engineering, we start with the hardest of all possible things uh, um, to, to go after in the sense that software engineering is one of the disciplines that probably takes the longest to become very uh, efficient at. Um, although once you are efficient at, I do think it's one of the jobs that uh, because you can be measured in lines of code and quality and number of bugs and, and what you're pushing into production, it's, it's well suited, but it's, it's a hard place to start. What I get excited about are jobs that there's a lot more numbers and a lot easier to learn. Um, so um, things like becoming a sales development rep, these people, the relatively junior positions around the world at companies need to like, tar like target certain personas, reach out, establish initial calls, customer success and customer service um, 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 agents, um, um, UX designers, um, uh, and just general um, graphic designers. Um, we even see it within recruiting. I mean, we run a recruitment shop. Our recruiters are absolutely world-class. We've developed a pretty good uh, program to train and help people practice becoming recruiters. Um, recruiters uh, in the US are, are in more demand than software engineers right now. LinkedIn has 300,000 openings for recruiters against 200,000 openings for software engineers, and and a recruiter with four years of experience is making one hundred and fifty thousand USD per year. Um, you don't need all you need is a computer and a LinkedIn connection and some knowledge of what different job titles are to 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 do some of the work uh, on recruiting. So we see an opportunity to to to, to make that happen um, as well. So we're very excited to see more of these companies. Um, some of the some of the initiatives we're thinking about are going more kind of function by function and how do we build the ta the raw how do we identify the raw talent how do we equip that talent to be effective but then very critically how do we make it plug and play and easy for companies around the world to plug into this talent pool so you're not just kind of posting a job on a local job board and hoping for the best and um, i think we're going to see a lot of innovation there and 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 uh, professor aditya this is where kind of the overlaps with your ed tech work become very strong because i i mean we're also seeing africa's at the cusp of a major ed tech uh innovation and and, and revolution um, um we're sitting here looking at uh what what's been going on in india you know india in 2014 if i've got my numbers right basically had about uh 29 million dollars in ed tech spending i think it's over 2 billion um annual spending now um, Kenya, Ken, uh, sorry, Africa as a continent, I, I think saw something like 30 to 40 million um, in, in the last couple each each year. But in in next five to 10 years, we see it to be way more um, like uh, Kenya uh, or way like more like India. And I do think that what we're going to see is less focus on just kind of classroom learning and more focused on, on on these education to employment pathways and innovation. So, yeah, a lot of work to be done. We're, we're, we're really excited about it. Thanks, Paul. Jarvis, I'm going to let you uh, get away with the final closing statement. We have exactly one minute on the clock, so go for it. Make every second count, my friend. All right. Yes, yes. So, so I'll, I'll let you summarize, like, just, you know, uh, once again, drawing on my personal and work experience, um, you know, some of the jobs that had been, uh, you know, 
uh, replaced by uh, AI or any other forms of technology, you know, cannot be replaced permanently and um, just purely down to uh, the human side. Uh, take, for example, a lot, a, lot, a lot of companies, including big banks, you know, have adopted the use of both uh, on their systems, you know, um, take, for example, um, so if, if you are a, you know, a lower tier, um, you know, customer of a bank, you know, you're likely to be connected to a bowl uh, just, you know, through your online banking. Um, so, um, so, uh, so, so those customers, you know, with a higher tier of, uh, of, of membership, say, uh, for example, maybe they deposit more than 100 thousand pounds into a bank in the uk you're more likely to connect to a real person in less than in less than one minute so that's the difference you know um just you know uh, just in, in the post pandemic worlds um, um so uh, especially as a bank customer um you know some of the issues you know uh, uh have to be raised um through a human being through a uh, an advisor uh, because humans you know have you know uh you know uh uh have psychological effect we have you know we have emotions we have some kind of you know mentality we need to talk to someone who can really understand our needs and requirements so 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 this type so these types of, of of jobs cannot be replaced by 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 technology or both you know permanently thanks jarvis and i think that's a key point isn't it i mean empathy is is, is an yeah, exactly. absolute yeah exactly uh, is it is, yeah. is a human trait. I mean, it's it's it's, it's a living trait. I'm sure if animals happen, but yeah. that is a differentiator. Yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a pleasure uh, hosting you on this panel. As always, you never get enough of time in Horace's panel, so I hope we <laughs> yeah. need to have enough of content. Sure. I think we could go on and on. This is some really interesting stuff over here. But you know, we see a, a mix of digital transformation, uh, demographics. Uh, uh, global, you know, you know, uh, migrations happening over here, mm-hmm. sectoral changes, and most important, change in mindset of people uh, as we move forward. Uh, because yes, what the one thing I think which all of us can agree on is that the future is absolutely uncertain and it's not mm-hmm. in stone. Um, you know, it, it has been a pleasure having you all over, and I hope a lot of us over here can collaborate further and take us forward. I'm stopping mm-hmm. the streaming at this moment. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.